Ben Ryan is a frequent guest on our nighttime show. He is the CEO and founder of American Majority. But he's also the author of a new book. It's called The Adversaries, a story of Boston and Bunker Hill, a historical revolution war battle. He joins us now. Ben Ryan, it's great to see you. Good to be with I, you. You're one of those people I talk to all the time but on remote. Right. And I listen carefully because... You are deeply informed. You you understand Washington, I think, the way it actually works on a much deeper yeah. level than most people do. Um, anyway, so but I appreciate yeah, you no, being I here. And I want to ask you here. about your book because I'm genuinely interested in it. What is it? Why did you write it? So really, the genesis for it was I've always been fascinated by the life of Dr. Joseph Warren, who, you know, I, in some of my research, I found out that Ronald Reagan was as well. Mentions him in his first inaugural address, says, Dr. Joseph Warren, who might have been one of the greatest of the founding fathers, and then quotes from his speech that Warren gave in March of 1775 at the Old South Meeting House. So Reagan knew who Warren was and considered him one of the greatest of the founding fathers. But he was a protege of Sam Adams, young Harvard educated doctor, was only 34 at the time of Bunker Hill. But in those last nine or 10 months before Bunker Hill truly became one of the leading forces in the resistance to Parliament and King's ministers and, and the Intolerable Acts, became the president of provincial Congress, became a major general in the new army. And then on the day of Bunker Hill. Wait, so he's just a Boston doctor who became a general in yeah, the revolutionary. And America. actually intentionally so. They were thinking he would be the surgeon general of the new army. And he said, no, I want to be on the military side of it. Uh, and so gets appointed. It's literally just a few days before Bunker Hill. Goes to Bunker Hill to volunteer to fight. And so the whole, just the whole sequence of events that leads up to that Can day. Let me ask you to pause. Back up, because we can't, I don't think we can assume any historical knowledge on the part of anybody. This is one of the reasons I wrote this. Including ourselves. I mean, right, it's, right. what was Bunker Hill? I'll, I will just say this and I'll, I'll unpackage it. Bunker Hill was principal defiance in the face of this overpowering, overwhelming, arbitrary authoritarianism. In which finally Englishmen stopped talking to each other. And this is the point I make in the book. 85% of Massachusetts at the time was direct English lineage. They weren't Scottish. They weren't Irish. And all of a sudden, Englishmen over those last nine or 10 months decided that some of the fundamentals that they thought they agreed on, rule of law, who governs, where do you actually get laws, how do these laws, how are they enacted, realized they couldn't agree on fundamentals. And all of a sudden, they realized there's no compromise. And Parliament, the King's ministers, and General Gage, who's the, the governor, the British governor at the yeah. time of Matt Say. Kind of a thoughtful guy, actually. He was, and he was stuck in a really awkward position where he wanted to enforce the acts, realized... You know, th these are unenforceable, although they were his suggestion, by the way. The intolerable acts that really the closing of the Boston port, they're going to have to pay for the, the tea. Um, the whole idea of basically removing the idea of self-governance from Massachusetts, suspending the charter of Massachusetts. These were all Gage's suggestions. And then he realizes these aren't really enforceable. Uh, the king's ministers, Lord Dartmouth, Lord North, who's the prime minister at the time, are not supporting him. And he's stuck in this very awkward situation where he realized he can't enforce these. The colonists are not submitting. The, those in London are stuck with this very awkward, like you're going to enforce these these laws. And he's like, you haven't given me the men and the, the equipment, the, the munitions to actually support these and things. And he's, kind of, as I remember, if I remember my history, he's the king's emissary. He, in, is, in the, the he is the commander of all British forces in North America. He is the British yes. governor of Massachusetts. But he's not anti-American necessarily. No, he's married to an American, yeah. which plays a role in this. He's married to Margaret Kimball Gage, who is from New Jersey. She's an American. He married a Jersey girl. He married a Jersey girl. And so there's another part of the story that I tell as well. Some historians will agree with me on how I tell that part of the story. Others won't. But I thought it made for a good story how I told it. Well, Warren had a an informant that was high placed in British command. He went to the grave, never revealing who that source was. But he was privy to some information that the only way he would have known was somebody in British high command. And people have suspected it might have been Margaret Kimball Gage. So I play off that theme. I have fun with it, right? 90% of the story is fact. I, I try to recreate one of the goals that I had in this. Obviously, I'm fascinated by Dr. Joseph Warren. I want to tell his story. I want people to be you know, more better acquainted with him, but also just to tell a story that was really fascinating. I mean, some of these things, I think it was Twain that said truth is stranger than fiction. Some of the stuff that took place, I try to be as true to it as I can. At the same time, I color the edges, right? 90% of it's fact, 10% color the edges to tell the story. Because I think this is one of the things, I mean, this is this is one of the things, Tucker, where I, when I wrote Restoring Our Republic, my first book, I want to go back so people understand where we came from, the fundamentals, but also to, to be interested in American history, to actually understand American history because of all the revisionists, 
that are ha that's happening today. The revisionism was 1619. Let's go back and have a conversation about history, but let's make history exciting and approachable so that people can really dig in and understand it. So that was, I mean, I wrote Restoring Our Republic as a nonfiction, but this is historical fiction. And it was fun. And I found so out a lot about let's it. let's back up and get granted. Okay, a couple of things. Okay. What was Bunker Hill? Just okay, so, yeah, I mean, Bunker Hill was a battle. It's a battle. It was a battle on the Where afternoon. Where is Bunker Hill? It, it's on Charlestown Peninsula. It is the afternoon of June 17th, um, in which the night before, based off certain amount of intelligence, the Americans knew that the British were going to actually fortify Charlestown Heights, which is Bunker Hill. A strategically significant, significant geographic location in the city right, of Boston. Which, you know, not to go into too much detail, they'd actually had a fortification, the British did, when they retreated from Lexington and Concord and then abandoned it, and everybody came back into Boston, and then they realized if the Americans ever acquire enough artillery of a large enough size, they're going to basically run us out of Boston. We should probably fortify the heights at Dorchester and in, in Charlestown. So they were going to fortify Bunker Hill June 18th. And the Americans found out through a variety of sources that they were going to do that. So the night of the 16th of June and then into the early morning of June 17th, uh, William Prescott, who's the commander of the redoubt on, on Breed's Hill, uh, leads about 1,200 men onto the hill at night. They dig this earth redoubt. And all of a sudden the British wake up in the morning and realize, oh my gosh, the Americans have dug in over the heist. They are now so close, they can actually put Boston, they can put our ships, they can put Boston under fire from well-placed cannons. Uh, if we don't run them off the hill that day, our days in Boston are over. We're going to be sailing for Nova Scotia maybe within a couple days if we don't run them off the hill today. So what'd they do? Um, in typical arrogance, the British really thought, this is, the, this is one of the interesting dynamics, Tucker, that I was trying to play out a little bit. The, the, the British officers, for the most part, there were a few that were realists, thought, we're going to go, we're going to charge up the hill with bayonets. These farmers, these provincials are going to run away at the first sight of a bayonet charge. And all of a sudden they realized, these are some of the best troops, best regiments in the British Army at the time, realized the Americans are not running. And it, it literally, some will say it was technically two charges, but it was three charges. And the only reason they won is because the Americans in the redoubt ran out of gunpowder. But it was, it was one of those things where the British really felt that we're going to run up this hill with bayonets. The Americans are going to run. They're going to retreat immediately. We'll take over. We'll build our fortifications. And then all of a sudden, they realized, it literally it was 50% casualties for the British that day. 50%. We sent about 2,000 men over. There were 1,000 casualties. 200 and some died that day. 800 and some were wounded, but the, the medical care was so bad, another couple hundred died after that. It was it was truly one. So about a quarter of their troops died. No, it was one of those things where actually it was one of the highest casualty days for British officers in the entire Revolutionary War was Bunker Hill. No way. It was a brutal fight in which Lord Percy was one of the British officer generals in Boston at the time, he was that one that actually saved the British forces that went to Lexington and Concord to raid, destroy American munitions, all of a sudden realized the Americans swarmed them. 4,000, they, they think about 4,000 militia swarmed the British on the way back from Concord, and Lord Percy comes out with a rescue force and had kind of had that dismissive view of the Americans before that day. And he comes back and he tells Gage, and I have this scene in the book, he tells Gage, um, first of all, they fought, they fought like animals. They would ride within 10 yards, 20 yards of the British to try and get a better shot. He's like, they were basically insane. And they have, <laughs> they have men among them who know what they are doing. Because a lot of these the, the officers in the new American army had actually fought in the French and Indian War. In fact, William Prescott was one of the only Americans that was offered a commission in the British Army, a full-time commission. He refused it because he felt the British officers were very dismissive of Americans, had a very dim view of them, so he refused it. But these guys knew what they were doing. And that was one of the other dynamics I wish I had a little more time to play off of, where we always have this... this misguided view that somehow Bunker Hill was about this very well-trained British army going up the hill against these farmers that really didn't know what they were doing. The New Englanders were, were warlike people. I mean, they, had, they had been at war for generations, from the King Phil King's Philip's War to French and Indian War. They knew what they were doing. They had men among them who knew what they were doing. And the British were actually not as well-trained and actually not as accustomed to fighting as people think. Some of these regiments that fought on Bunker Hill hadn't really seen action for like a decade or two. And they weren't fighting for their own land. No, they weren't fighting for their own land. I mean, this is the one thing where you realize in this whole telling of the story with Joseph Warren and these, the, the Americans, they, they decided that we know what we believe, and there's a certain line where we're going to say there's no compromise. So how did the Americans do that day? Um, the casualties, they, most of the casualties, it was not quite 200 dead, 140, 150 dead that day, uh, and, and about two to three times as many wounded. Um, and most of those came when they ran out of ammunition, had to have this kind of hasty retreat off off the hill and 
you know, those, those people that know Dr. Joseph Warren's story, I'm not ruining it all. You know, this young Harvard educated doctor who had gone to, he literally had to borrow a musket to fight at Bunker Hill. Yeah, he had to, he had to borrow a horse, borrow a musket, goes to the top of the hill and Israel Putnam, who becomes one of the major generals in, in the revolution, in the American army under Washington, uh, realizes that he's been made a major general, says, I'll give you command. And Warren said, I'm not here to command, I'm here to fight. Put me where the fighting's the heaviest. And Putnam goes, well, it's not gonna be here, it's gonna be down there in the redoubt. So he literally, Warren walks down the hill under heavy cannon fire, goes into the redoubt and Prescott goes, you're in command. He goes, no, I'm not in command. I'm here to fight. He literally becomes a musket on in the redoubt as the British are coming charging up the hill and then obviously run out of ammo. And uh, as the retreat, as they're retreating out of that, uh, he's covering their retreat and um, is shot by a British officer. It's a pretty incredible story when you think about that it. That is Tucker. amazing. More, more, how, tell me about if, it. it. Well, if you go to Bunker Hill, if you go to the monument today, which I would, I would encourage everybody to do, um, they've placed a plaque where they think that he actually fell. And it's, it's really felt by a lot of historians it was a British officer. And I play, you know, not to give away too much of the story, I play off of some of that. That's the adversaries. It's Dr. Joseph Warren and Francis Lord Rodden, who's a young British officer. He's an Irishman. These are all historical figures, right? There's no fictional characters in this book. A lot of the dialogue's real. But the British officers hated Warren. And this is real. This is like they truly hated Dr. Joseph Warren because Sam Adams appealed to the mechanics, the tradesmen, right? He had that. John Hancock appealed to more of the, the elites in society. Warren had the ability to really overlap between these two forces inside of Boston, the mechanics, tradesmen, and the elite in society. And they realized that he was really a spark for the resistance. The British officers did. They hated him. They loathed him. They feared him. There was a lot, there was a lot of back and forth with Warren and the British officers before Bunker Hill. And then, obviously, on, the, on that day, one of the British officers identified him, saw him, and uh, you know, shot him. Knew who he was. Knew who he was. Oh, yeah, absolutely. The other thing is too, the provincials, the, 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 the Americans go and they're dressed, you know, in homespun, all of these, you know, uh, homemade clothes. Warren goes to fight on Bunker Hill, literally in his finest gray suit, a silk shirt. They were like, he, he was literally looked like he was going to a wedding. So he's dressed in his finest and he goes to fight at Bunker Hill. And it's, I have a scene where, you know, he interacted with a, with a freedman by the name of Peter Salem. And I don't know if that actually happened, but they were both in the earth redoubt that day. And Peter Salem asked him, why are you here? Like, why are you fighting? Like, you're the president of the Provincial Congress, you're a major general in the army, you don't have to be here. And I have Warren saying, it's, I either believe something or I don't. And if I do believe something, I better be willing to fight for it. But you can see that in Warren's life. It's, it's just one of those things that I, he's a singular man, and I wanted more people to know about. How old was he? he, he his birthday is June 11th, so he literally just turned 34 days before Bunker Hill. Had four children. His wife had passed away tragically in February of 1773 from a high fever. He couldn't save her. He was considered one of the best physicians in Boston. Couldn't save her. And um, four young children. What happened? I think nothing extraordinary. None, none of them really lived that long. A couple of them lived into adulthood, but nothing truly extraordinary. Um, and one of the interesting parts of that story, there was a young captain of, of the militia that came through out of Connecticut, out of New Haven, by the name of Benedict Arnold. And they became friends. In, the, in a short time, they became friends because Benedict Arnold was one of the guys that first came up with the idea. He didn't realize Ethan Allen was thinking along the same lines, but we've got to go to Ticonderoga, the fort, lightly garrisoned, but we've got to get the cannon. We've got to get the cannon down to Boston to get the, the British out. And so I have this scene where they interact. And it, it, they probably did interact on a certain level because when Warren dies, um, he was engaged to Mercy Scalay, and she wrote Benedict Arnold and said, these children are orphaned. They've been left destitute. Uh, he started supporting them with his own personal money, Benedict Arnold did. And then he wrote to Congress and, and basically would not quit in saying, you have to support the children of Major General Joseph Warren until they are of age. And finally, because of Benedict Arnold's lobbying of Congress, they did start funding and, and giving a certain amount of a pension. Really? Yes. It's real. History does not record that. No, I know. Anyway. No, it doesn't. I mean, these are some of the really fascinating stories that you come across in doing all of this research. All the lives that intersected on Bunker Hill and in Cambridge and in Boston in those nine or 10 months. Again, it's just a fascinating period of time.